What you are about to hear is very disturbing, shocking, and incredible as it may seem, very true. You will undoubtedly be taken through a variety of emotions as you listen to this story. I should also warn you that this podcast episode contains many instances of sexual violence, as well as violence against children. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth. In April of 2008, a 19-year-old woman was brought to the hospital in Amstetten, Austria, a town outside of Vienna. All that the hospital staff was told was that her name was Kirsten Fritzel. The doctors, after checking her out, were confused as to what was wrong with her. She was incredibly pale to the point where her skin was nearly translucent. She was suffering from muscle cramps and she began to have seizures. She also suffered kidney and lung failure and even had to be resuscitated. They couldn't pinpoint her issues, but they needed to act fast because according to one of the doctors who was treating her, she was in a state between life and death. Her condition was so serious that she's placed into intensive care and she even had to be placed into an artificial coma. The doctors, they're baffled. They don't know if she's suffering from a disease or if it's something genetic. So they attempt to find her medical records within the Austrian National Registry. There are zero records of a woman named Kirsten Fritzel. Not only does she not have any medical history, but according to the Austrian administration, she doesn't even exist. The hospital staff then turned to the man who had brought in the young woman. He does say that he is the woman's grandfather, but he doesn't offer any other information about Kirsten. He is aggressive and arrogant and doesn't want to answer any questions. He just simply demands that they treat her and then release her so she can just go back home. The hospital staff find his demeanor so strange that they contact the police. When the police arrive, they discover that Kirsten's grandfather is Joseph Fritzel, who is the father of Elizabeth Fritzel, a woman who had disappeared over 24 years ago to join a cult. Joseph tells the police that Kirsten was found at his front door. With her, she had a note from Elizabeth that said, please help her. Kirsten is very scared of strangers. She has never been in a hospital before. I've asked my father for help because he is the only person she knows. It is imperative that the doctors find Elizabeth quickly to find out more about Kirsten and her history. So authorities focus on finding Elizabeth, not only for the health of Kirsten, but also because they believe that Elizabeth might be guilty of criminal neglect of her children. After two days have gone by, there is still no word from Elizabeth. So the hospital decides to put out a public plea on the news. When the hospital administrator appeared on the news, he said that they, quote, wanted the mother to contact them and that they would treat any contact with her with high discretion and will hopefully get a step further in our diagnosis and treatment. Elizabeth still never came forward. So officials then went to the Fritzel home to begin taking DNA samples from Elizabeth's brothers and sisters, her mom and dad, and other children there. 
Now, this was important because three of the children living in Joseph Fritzl's home were also Elizabeth's. She had abandoned them at the doorstep of her parents with notes to please take care of them. Officials were hoping that since Elizabeth didn't come forward, maybe one of her partners would because they believed that a woman with so many children may have had more than one partner and one of them may have had a criminal record that they could match and find an answer to Kirsten's problem. The doctors were at a loss and the officials were trying every avenue they could to determine what might be wrong with Kirsten. Joseph Fritzl, Kirsten's grandfather, he kept postponing the appointment for the DNA sample. He never had the time. Now, during the time that Kirsten was in the hospital, Joseph repeatedly thanked the officials and the hospital staff for all of their help. Officials were ready to assign a crisis relief group to the family because her situation, Kirsten's situation, was so dire. They truly believed that without any direction, Kirsten would not make it out of the hospital alive. Joseph then realizes that he's in an impossible situation. So he finds Elizabeth and takes her to the hospital to visit Kirsten. Now you might be wondering, how could he so easily just go out and find Elizabeth, right? She's been missing for 24 years. This gets even more interesting. It's now been five days that Kirsten has been hospitalized. When Elizabeth shows up, her appearance is shocking. Now people were used to seeing her photo Uh, from 24 years ago when she had been gone missing. But even though she's at this point now 42 years old, she appears to look 52 or even 62. She looks very sickly. Her skin is pale and it's almost as transparent as her daughter's. Elizabeth visits Kirsten, but she doesn't give the hospital staff any information. And to top it off, Elizabeth looks terrified. The doctors, again, very concerned and kudos to the doctors, call the police. Both Elizabeth and Joseph are taken in to be questioned. The whole situation is just very, very strange. The police then question Elizabeth and her father, Joseph, separately for five hours Elizabeth doesn't say a word. The police accuse her of the illegal confinement of a child. They need to know the story. Elizabeth would only agree to talk with them if they promised that she would never have to see her father, Joseph, again. The police agreed. And when Elizabeth finally begins to talk, what she says chills the police to the bone. Elizabeth says she has never been in a cult. She has been imprisoned by her father, Joseph, since 1984 in a cellar. And the reason that Kirsten is so ill is that for Kirsten's entire 19 years of life, she has lived with her mother in that same cellar. It would later be determined that Kirsten was suffering from severe vitamin D deficiency, from oxygen deficiency, and kidney problems. Elizabeth further tells the police that within this same cellar, currently, are two more children, Stefan, who was 18 at the time, and Felix, who was five but that over the years, she's actually given birth to seven children in total. The other children that were not living with her in the cellar were taken by Joseph to live outside the cellar in the same home that Elizabeth grew up in. These children were Lisa, who was now 15, Monica, who's now 14, and Alexander, who's now 12. 
Elizabeth then goes on to tell them that when she was 18 years old, she was drugged and then kidnapped by her own father, Joseph. Joseph kept her imprisoned and raped her repeatedly, eventually resulting in the birth of seven children. The prison where they were kept? It was just underneath the house of the family home where Elizabeth had grown up. After Elizabeth tells her story to the police, Joseph is, of course, arrested. The next day, the story, the whole story, hits the newspapers. So what do we know about Joseph? Well, Joseph was born in 1935, and shortly after he was born, his parents divorced. His mother, Maria, uh, was evidently a very hard woman. She never wanted any kids. But after her husband left her, she was left to raise Joseph on her own, and she despised every minute of it, and she never let Joseph forget that. She never showed Joseph love or attention, and she often left him alone for hours at a time, even while he was still very young. When she was home with him, she would often hit him or punish him for no reason at all. Joseph stated, quote, she never showed me any love. She beat me and kicked me until I was on the floor and bleeding. I felt so weak and humiliated. I never got a kiss from her or even a hug, although I tried very hard to please her. The only thing she did with me was to go to church. I had a horrible fear of her. She kept insulting me and told me I was a Satan, a criminal, a no good. As Joseph grew older, he would often peep into homes while people were being intimate. He would follow women in the park frequently. As time went on, Joseph eventually studied to become an engineer, and then he married Rosemary. Once Joseph and Rosemary are married, Joseph becomes a totally different person, a tyrant. Rosemary often suffers verbal and physical abuse. And not long after they're married, Joseph then moved his mother in to live with them. Now, during their marriage, Rosemary also gives birth to seven children, five girls and two boys. Elizabeth was the fourth child. Now, at one point, Rosemary's sister was interviewed, and she said that one time, Rosemary came to her mother when she was pregnant with her last child, the seventh child, because Joseph had broken Rosemary's foot. Even the children were petrified of Joseph. As soon as he walked in the door, no matter what the kids were doing, they all stopped and went quiet. They were required to stay calm. Always stay calm. One of Elizabeth's friends from school said that Elizabeth would talk about how oppressive it was at home. She preferred being at school more than she liked being at home. Before Elizabeth disappeared in August of 1984, Elizabeth had tried to run away to Vienna at least one time. She didn't want to be at home. And what she eventually told police was that the abuse from her father started when she was 11 years old and that she had kept it a secret. When her childhood friends look back to see if they noticed any red flags, one of them remembers that Elizabeth never talked about boys, and some days she was extraordinarily quiet. But as kids, you just chalk it up to them having a bad day. When Joseph was 32, he was arrested and sentenced to 18 months in prison for following a woman home and then raping her. At that point, he had been married to Rose Marie for 12 years. Rose Marie then told the family that Joseph had to go away abroad for contract work and he would be back in a few months. Even though she had the opportunity to simply leave and start over, she didn't take it. Now, Joseph's plan for the cellar, where he planned to keep Elizabeth, 
began in 1978, and this was six years before Elizabeth would turn 18. Now, although it's also been said that in reality, he had hatched his plan for kidnapping Elizabeth when he was in jail in 1967 for rape. It should also be noted that when Joseph was in prison in 1967, his daughter Elizabeth was one years old at the time. One. Joseph said he knew that he had an evil side and that he would likely act on it again. So instead of taking the chance that he'd be arrested again for rape, he came up with the idea of just kidnapping one of his daughters instead. In order to complete the cellar, Joseph had to get a permit to build a bomb shelter. Now, which at the time, it wasn't unusual because it was at the end of the Cold War. Now, he was a trained engineer and could literally do most of the work on the cellar himself. As he built the cellar, no one, family or neighbors, really took notice because they were used to him building things all the time. This was just another project. When Joseph was questioned about what it was that he was doing, his story was that the building was an extension to his home so that he could rent it out to more tenants, which wasn't unusual at all in Austria. One pair of Joseph's neighbors, however, who lived a couple of doors down, always thought that it was strange that the Fritzl house was the only house that didn't have an open backyard. The Fritzl house was surrounded by tall trees and hedges. And even when the neighbors asked him to trim them, he told them no and to leave it be. They also said that the Fritzls kept to themselves. They had been invited many times to several parties in the neighborhood, but they never came. So eventually they just stopped being invited. They had said that Joseph was very firm with his children and required absolute obedience. Rosemary, on the other hand, was very submissive. Even her sister, Christina, said that everyone in the house was afraid of Joseph. He would hit Rosemary frequently. And according to her sister, Rosemary was like a submissive dog. It was like his entire family were all his prisoners. So six years after he began building the cellar, the cellar is finally complete and it's now time for Joseph to put his plan into action. He gives his entire family, including his wife, explicit instructions to never, ever visit the cellar. And because of his past violent behavior towards everyone in the house, no one ever did. On Wednesday, August 28th of 1984, Rose Marie is away from the house. As is typical, Joseph and Elizabeth get into an argument. And Joseph drags her to the garage, which is at the back of the house. He then uses chloroform to knock her out. And then he handcuffs her. When she finally comes to... She finds herself in a cellar, handcuffed and unable to get out. Now, you would think that people would wonder where Elizabeth went, right? Well, Joseph had been planning this abduction of his daughter for years. So he had everything planned right down to the tiniest of details. Shortly after Joseph abducted Elizabeth, Joseph made sure to tell a close friend and business associate all about it. The man said he never doubted Joseph. He said that he, if he gave you his word, you could count on it. He said that he saw the Fritzels every summer and he had known Elizabeth as a child. When Joseph came to see him that day, the friend said that he appeared very upset he told his friend that Elizabeth will not be coming home. She's become involved in a cult and she's disappeared. Now, Rosemary is devastated. She doesn't know where her daughter is. So she and Joseph go to the police and report Elizabeth missing. 
Joseph acts devastated and mentions to police that he thought she had run away again, but she must have been abducted by a cult. Now, Elizabeth's aunt, Christina, remember she's Rosemary's sister, she also helps to search for Elizabeth. Christina and her husband head to Amstetten to look to help look for her. They checked everywhere they could all night long and no one could find her. The police then research Elizabeth's past and they talk to her relatives who say she was a very good child, but was often found just standing at the window, looking outside for hours. A childhood friend said Elizabeth was very quiet, but that when they were together, they'd always have fun. At home, though, she said Elizabeth was different. She was very reserved and didn't take part in everything that the family did. As Elizabeth got older, around the age of 14, her grades are no longer as good as they once were, and she had very few friends. Still, there were no red flags from any of the adults who surrounded her. Now, police do find out that two years before this disappearance, Elizabeth had run away from home to Vienna. She had run away with a friend, and when the police found them, they never bothered looking into why she ran away in the first place. When she went missing again, the police just assumed that, well, she'd run away again. Not long after Elizabeth had disappeared, A letter arrived at the house from Elizabeth saying that it was pointless to look for her because she was deeply involved in a cult and was happy there and she definitely was not coming home. Now, because Joseph had covered his tracks so well and because Elizabeth at this point was considered an adult and now everybody's got this letter from Elizabeth, no one ever continued to look for her. Not her friends, not her mom, not even the police. No one considered her missing because they had this letter from her. The police fully believe that she left on her own, and so they close the case. Her friends, though, didn't buy it. Because she rarely left the house, her friends didn't know how Elizabeth would have even met anyone who would have been involved in a cult in the first place. They believed that she was somewhere, but not in a cult. Now, due to this information and some additional new information, including, like I said, this information from Elizabeth's friends, the police did reopen the case and they attempted to figure out why she would have run away at all. So they look to the family. They discover that Joseph is very well liked and respected in the Amstetten community, not only by the authorities, but by the banks and with locals who held political office. He was known for being good natured, but that he has a very strong character about him. At home, however, police find that Joseph is very different. He is extremely authoritarian. Rosemary, his wife, she isn't very assertive at all and rarely gets a say in what happens in the home. Christina, again Rosemary's sister, remembers Joseph being very nice when they first met, but as the years went by, he didn't treat his children very well. He was considered very violent, especially with Elizabeth. The thing is, though, is that Joseph took Elizabeth with him everywhere. None of the other children, just Elizabeth. He always wanted her at home and he would not let her have friends over or even a boyfriend. Although it's said that while in school, she did in fact have a boyfriend. Joseph would even go through Elizabeth's personal things and read her diary. When friends would come over to see if Elizabeth could come out with them, it was Joseph who answered the door and Joseph who told them that she couldn't, she wasn't allowed, and then asked them to leave. None of her friends ever got past the doorway at Elizabeth's house. 
Now, after listening to family and friends, the police believe that it was Joseph who was the reason that Elizabeth ran away, but that she did, in fact, run away and join a cult. So after a year goes by with no word from Elizabeth and no further leads, the police close the case. For the first five years, yes, five years, Elizabeth is completely alone in the cellar. Joseph brings her food and he rapes her once a day and always at nightfall. He never talks to her. Now, based on Elizabeth's testimony at trial, which we'll get to, Joseph is estimated to have raped his daughter around 3,000 times. Now, a couple of years into her captivity, Elizabeth did become pregnant. Uh, She had a miscarriage at 10 weeks, and she had this miscarriage alone. It is said that shortly after this happened, she contemplated suicide. In 1988, when Elizabeth was 22, Uh, She became pregnant again, and this time she carries the baby to term. When it's time for her to give birth, Joseph will not take her to the hospital. Instead, he brings her a book on pregnancy and childbirth, some towels, and some medical instruments, and she is forced to give birth in the basement by herself. Kirsten is the first child to be born. A year later, Stefan is born, then Lisa, then Monica. After being in the basement now for 10 years, she has four children. Elizabeth does turn out to be quite an exceptional mother. Uh, She educates them and shows them plenty of love. Uh, They do have a television in the cellar, but that's their only connection to the outside world. The only other human they ever saw outside of their mother and siblings was Joseph. It is said that once Joseph brought down a bird to show the children and another time he brought down snow so that they could see and feel what snow felt like. Joseph, however, treats the children in the cellar much like he treats his family in the house with threats. He tells them that uh, if they act up, he will close the door forever and then see how long they'll survive without him. In 1996, Elizabeth is again pregnant, but this time with twins and the birth does not go well. Michael, one of the twins, suffered respiratory failure shortly after Elizabeth gave birth and she begged and pleaded with Joseph to please take him to the hospital, but Joseph refused. Michael, shortly thereafter, passed away in his mother's arms. So what Joseph did is he then takes Michael's body out of the basement and into the house where he then incinerates his body in a heater. He then later scatters the ashes in the backyard of the family home. By this time, the cellar is getting very small with all of the children. So Joseph comes up with another plan. He forces Elizabeth to write a note and then takes one of the babies, Lisa, who is currently nine months old. And what he does is he leaves her on the doorstep of his house along with this note. In the morning, Rosemary hears the baby's cries and finds a large box with Lisa inside. She also finds the note, which is written in Elizabeth's handwriting, and asks them to look after the baby because she cannot. It further states to not come look for her. Now, Joseph eventually performs this same scenario with another two of Elizabeth's children, Monica and Alexander. He takes them when they're young so that they can't talk. Monica is also found outside the entrance of the home, but this time, Rosemarie received a phone call 
asking her to take care of the child. It sounded like Elizabeth, but it was later assumed that Joseph used a recording of his daughter's voice to play over the phone for Rosemary. Now, Rosemary, she reported this phone call to the police. She was especially surprised that Elizabeth knew the family's brand new and unlisted phone number. When people questioned why the children were even there at the Fritzl household, Joseph just said that Elizabeth was a bad mother and she had abandoned her children at their doorstep. Now, when the second baby shows up, when Monica shows up, the press starts to take notice of this. They question Elizabeth's mothering skills, saying things like, you know, what kind of mother does this? And Joseph mentions again to the press that she has been missing since 1984 and they believe that she's with a cult. All three of the children that came from the seller uh, were legally adopted by Joseph and Rose Marie. And because of this, the Fritzl family was required to have regular visits from social services. Social services never asked how the children came to live with the family. Uh, they all believed Joseph's story. Even the police felt that it was very believable. Neighbors also believed the story and they felt bad for Rosemary, who had she'd already raised seven children, but now she had to raise additional children as well. As these three children grow up in the house, uh, they live somewhat normal life. You know, Joseph makes sure to take photos of them at barbecues and having fun in the pool. He then takes these photos to the children in the cellar and shows them how much fun their brother and sisters are having. The children that remain in the cellar, they never see sunlight. They don't even know what grass feels like or what the leaves look like when they change in the fall. They don't even know what wind would feel like on their face. During the entire 24 years, 24 years that Elizabeth and her children were kept in the basement, the Fritzels rented out rooms in their home. During the time Elizabeth was there, over 100 renters had come and gone. How could they not have noticed anything unusual? Joseph also had super strict rules for his renters as well. Under no circumstances were they to go into the yard at the back of the house. And if they, if he found out that they had, their lease would be terminated immediately. They were also not allowed to own pets. Now, as time went on, the challenges of keeping up with two families were starting to take a toll on Joseph's engineering job. So Joseph quit this job and instead moved into real estate. This way he could move about more freely without people wondering where he was all of the time. Joseph had it planned out so well that what he would do is he would take the garbage from the cellar and toss it away at a location miles away. He also did grocery shopping miles away from home so that he could do it anonymously. Once he had these groceries and all the supplies, he would then wait until nighttime when everyone was asleep and then bring these down into the cellar. So of course at this time, this is Elizabeth's story. What she tells the police, the police have obviously arrested Joseph. And so the police then, they pay a visit to the Fritzl home. He had built what they call a perfectly concealed cellar whose sole purpose was to imprison his own daughter and later their children. In order to get to the cellar, you had to go down a set of stairs and then through eight locked doors before you even entered the living area where Elizabeth and her children were. Now, the thing is, the eighth door was concealed behind a shelving unit within Fritzl's basement workshop, which appeared to be just the last and final room of the cellar. But when you moved the bookshelf, 
there was a small door about half the size of a regular doorway, which rotated into the living quarters where Elizabeth and her children had been confined. Now, not only was this door locked, but it was also controlled by a remote control that required an electronic code that only Joseph knew. Once inside this entrance, there was a small kitchen, there was a bathroom, a small living area, a padded room that had been insulated so that it was soundproofed, and two very small bedrooms. The ceilings were only about six feet tall at the highest point, but averaged around five feet, six inches tall. The bathroom itself, if when you think of your own bathroom, you think of your own a room, correct? Uh, the bathroom wasn't a room of its own. Instead, it was just another open living space. Uh, it had a sink, an olive green toilet, and a tub. Now, within the bathroom area, it was all done in very large white tiles, almost like white subway tiles. But the grout over the years had become incredibly dirty. It was very dark and dirty. But drawn on the wall with what appeared to be markers or paint were bright, colorful pictures of flowers, a caterpillar drawn in bright yellow and an octopus just above the tub. The bathroom sink, it was a single sink just hanging from the wall with exposed pipes at the bottom and below these pipes, a bucket to catch the drips that came from the pipes. Um... Within the cellar, though, there was also an electric stove and laundry facilities. No natural light ever entered this place. There were no windows and there was very little air circulation. Now, to give you some idea as to how large this place was, in total, the size of the cellar was approximately 590 square feet in total. When the police get to the cellar, they free the two children that are still there, Stefan, who's 18, and Felix, who's five. As the police drive these two to the hospital, five-year-old Felix is glued to the window. The officer said that he was fascinated by the sky, the trees, and the cars that they passed on the road. Felix thought it was magical. Elizabeth and all of the children, including the three that had been moved upstairs along with Rosemary, Elizabeth's mother, were all then admitted to a psychiatric hospital to begin therapy. Kirsten was eventually released from the hospital and she joined the rest of her family. They were all offered new identities uh, so that they could remain completely anonymous. Now, because the children had never heard the sound of rain or had the sun on their faces, they had to adapt very slowly to these ways of life. Uh, completely normal for all of us, but magical and wondrous to the children who had never before had these experiences. It would later be found out that Elizabeth and her children required uh, quite a bit more care than they first expected. Not only did they need extensive care to adapt to the light after living in near darkness their whole lives, but they also had to cope with all the extra space that they had. They weren't used to having so much room. Additionally, it was found that Kirsten, who, remember, she was the oldest, she was 19, while she was in captivity, she would tear out her hair in clumps and reportedly, she would shred her dresses before stuffing them down the toilet. Stefan, he couldn't walk properly because he was five foot eight, and the average height of the cellar was five foot six, so he had to stoop a lot. When the lights are dimmed or doors are closed, Kirsten and Stefan go into anxiety and panic attacks. As the family is receiving care, 
dozens of reporters are camping out in front of this hospital, just waiting for the moment that they can take their photo, which is rumored to be worth more than $1 million. As Joseph sits in prison, he doesn't show any remorse. He's angry, but not at what he's done. He's angry because people are referring to him as a monster. He can't understand it because he took care of them. And even though he could have killed them, he didn't. Now, during questioning, Joseph comes up with various stories about why he had Elizabeth locked away. Uh, One story was that he needed to put her away to, quote, save her from people who had questionable moral standards. (laughs) That's ironic, isn't it? Because ever since she'd reached puberty, she had stopped obeying his rules. At trial, he said that the reason he locked Elizabeth away was because he wanted to protect her from a lifestyle that he didn't think was good for her. He said that she was a drug addict and ran with a bad crowd, so he locked her up to protect her from herself. On March 16th, 2009, Joseph Fritzl's trial begins. He arrives in court by a half dozen police officers, but hides his face behind a blue three ring binder as he walks in. He is charged with rape, slavery, kidnapping, and murder. He faces a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. In order to protect Elizabeth's identity, her testimony is actually taped and recorded. Uh, But no one but the people directly involved in the trial are allowed to view it. Her testimony, her taped and recorded testimony, was 11 hours long. Part of her testimony included that when Joseph showed up in the basement, he bullied the children into silence and then he punished them if they ever dared to answer back. Quote, he would often say we have no chance down under in the cellar where it all happened. He said he could close the door whenever he wanted and then we would see how we would survive. He was very brutal against me. And when I did not agree to have sex, then the kids would suffer. We knew he would kick us or be bad to us. It was his kind of communication to use rough words. He would be insulting against me and the children. When he said such words to the kids, they ducked and tried to get out of his way. He would say, shut up and get away from me. If that wasn't enough, he would be even more abusive. He wouldn't even let the kids develop their own personalities. He didn't like them to talk back. At the beginning, when they were small, it wasn't such a problem. But as they got bigger and started developing a personality, it was more of a problem. He did not like it, and he tried to stop it. He would not allow the kids to have their own will. He threatened to leave her and the children to rot behind the locked door and bullied the children when they dared to answer back to him. Elizabeth tried to give her children as normal a life as possible in the cellar, singing songs to them and telling them stories. But whenever Joseph entered the cellar, she said the atmosphere would change. When he went away, we led our own lives. When he was down here, it was all silence. When he came down to the cellar, we just tried to survive. Elizabeth also kept a journal while in captivity. She would detail how Joseph repeatedly raped and threatened his daughter and how she tried to fight fight him off. After Kirsten was born, Elizabeth did whatever she could to save her children from Joseph. In another entry... She writes about holding Michael in her arms before he turned blue and passed away. And then she wrote, at least he's in a better world now. The entire time that Joseph is listening to Elizabeth's testimony, he evidently begins to understand 
the horrible crimes he has committed. He apologizes to his family for the pain that he has brought them and takes full responsibility for his actions. On the fourth day, the jury passes along their verdict. Life in prison, and Joseph does not appeal. Many questions remain as to how Rosemary could not have known what was happening. Was she an accomplice? Had she just been deceived this whole time? No one may ever know the answer to this because she nor any other family member will ever be called to testify because Joseph pled guilty. We do know that Rosemary lived in perpetual fear of her husband and that she was submissive to his needs and was probably afraid to even say anything to her husband for fear he would kill her. Uh, with the family themselves, they all blamed Rosemary, saying that she had to have known what was going on. Rosemary's sister um, said that Rosemary, she lived for the children and only the children, and that she too was a victim, both mentally and physically. In the end, the police did clear Rosemary um, and Elizabeth, after quite a bit of time, uh, did finally forgive her mother. Uh, Joseph, in the meantime, has been incarcerated in prison for uh, quite some time now. His release is actually uh, supposed to be in 2024 when he is 89. While it's taken quite some time, as you might imagine, for all of the children to get to know one another and for the, quote, downstairs children to adapt to a world they have never known, they eventually were all able to move towards a new more normal life and they were eventually moved to a secret location in Austria under different identities. Elizabeth's mother, Rosemarie, she lives by herself in Austria and she too now has a completely different identity. Uh, Rosemarie and her husband, uh, no surprise, divorced shortly after the trial. Now, there's some kind of little ends that I wanted to tie up here because, um, especially one end uh, about Joseph's mother. Because if you remember, he had moved his mother, who evidently hated Joseph, he had moved her in with himself and Rosemary uh, shortly after they had gotten married. Well, in a report that was leaked after Joseph was arrested and convicted, Joseph evidently kept his mother in a windowless room in the attic of his home until she passed away. It is estimated that she died in 1980. Now, they moved to this house in 1959, so this would be 21 years that his mother was kept hidden away in a windowless room until she died. Now, after everything was said and done, you know, Joseph's in jail and and everybody's kind of moved on. After the news came out about the family, uh, the family home and the site where Elizabeth was held, it became a morbid uh, tourist attraction, as you might imagine. So in 2013, the entire cellar where Elizabeth and her children were held was filled in with concrete. In 2016, just a little side note here, uh, Joseph Fritzel had his teeth knocked out by fellow prisoners, and I would not get angry with you if you praised that. Uh, in 2017, Joseph actually changed his last name to Mayerhoff so that he too could live in anonymity. As far uh, at least part of the, the last information that we have is that in uh, 2019, Joseph is still behind bars in Kremsstein Prison, which is Austria's most secure psychiatric jail for mentally ill criminals, and he reportedly suffers from dementia. Now, a quote from a fellow prisoner says, quote, he doesn't want contact with others and altogether looks as though he has resigned himself to dying. Uh, other inmates want nothing to do with him, and just hearing his name makes me nauseous. 
So he keeps to himself and rarely leaves his cell because he's incredibly afraid of being attacked by other prisoners. So that's it. That's the story of Elizabeth Fritzel and her children. Um, it's a terrible story, I know, but very, very true. If you're interested in actually viewing the photos of where they had lived these entire 24 years down within the cellar, they are uh, plentiful on the internet. So if you're interested in looking those up, uh, you can certainly do so. And I want to end with this. Uh, if you know of anybody um, that would need help in regarding to any kind of rape, abuse, or um, incest situation, you can contact the organization called RAIN, R-A-I-N-N. It is the, um, it's at RAIN.org. It's the nation's largest anti-sexual violent or violence organization. Uh, it works with more than 1,000 local sexual assault service providers across the country and um, operates the DOD safe helpline for the Department of Defense. It also carries out programs uh, that help prevent sexual violence. It helps survivors and ensures that perpetrators are brought to justice. So again, the the website for them is RAIN, R-A-I-N-N dot org, O-R-G. Um, and they have a toll-free number at 1-800-656-HOPE, which is 4673. And again, that's 1-800-656-HOPE. So once again, thank you all so much for listening. I appreciate you if you happen to be uh, just listening through your favorite uh, podcast platform. I'd appreciate it if you headed over to Instagram, gave me a like, gave me a share. It's at Beach House 34 Podcast on Instagram. And if you happen to be listening to this uh, via YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and, and uh, hit that bell so that you're informed whenever brand new episodes uh, come available. So again, thank you. I will speak to you soon.